Good morning. This morning we are going to continue our service with the reading of our psalm. And our psalm this morning is Psalm number 57. And I'm going to read the odd numbered verses and invite you to read the even numbered verses together. Psalm number 57. And shall we stand together as we read God's word? Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. And he shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up. And God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. And I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be above all the earth. Let's pray. Father, and truly, we will praise you among the peoples, and we will sing among the nations. Lord, of your goodness, of your greatness, for you alone are worthy to be praised. And God, you love us with an everlasting love. You have invited us into your presence, and you've instructed us to come just as we are, to bring our sin to you and confess it to you. So we enter now into a moment of reflection and the private confession of our sin. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have in the shed blood of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we come now to your word, God, we pray that you would minister to each and every one of us, that you would strengthen us and heal us and and bless us, Lord. Father, minister to each and every one of us now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you will turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of Galatians as we continue our study through the Word. Now, we've come to this study of the book of Galatians. I'm excited to start this study here because the book of Galatians is one of the most important books that we have in the New Testament. It is probably the greatest presentation of our salvation, the salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It was the cornerstone of the Reformation. Martin Luther, it was said that he was wedded to this book because it really teaches us about our salvation and about the gospel message, that it is just simply through faith faith that we come to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Paul had been teaching through the churches in Galatia. He had built the churches up there on his first missionary journey. And then what happened was that there were some Judaizers uh, who had come from Jerusalem. And they came to the churches that were located there in the in the 
in the Roman province of Galatia. Now, those churches would be Iconium and, um, and Pisidia, Antioch, and Lystra and Derbe. These are the, the, the cities that, and the churches that were formed on Paul's journey that are within the Roman province, modern-day Turkey, um, and uh, the Roman province of Galatia. And these Judaizers, they were these Jewish Christians that had come from the church in Jerusalem. And they were being said that they were sent by James, who was the brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they came to these churches and they were saying that Paul was not a real apostle. That Paul was just simply a uh, uh, an evangelist, but that he not only was not an apostle, but that he wasn't bringing forth the true gospel, that he was believing, he was bringing forth an easy believe, uh, believism gospel, one of cheap grace. They, they were saying that you can't just accept Jesus Christ and be saved, but that what you have to do is that you have to then become a Jew. You have to take on the mark of circumcision and you have to keep the whole law. So so they came into the churches where Paul had established them and they were undermining Paul's authority. So there were really three points that Paul is going to make here in this letter. Number one, he is going to deal with the issue of his apostolic authority. So we're going to see that he is going to tackle that. But secondly, he is going to really talk about the doctrine of our salvation by faith in Christ. Uh, and it is by grace that we are saved. And it's not grace plus works, not grace plus the law. Uh, and so he is going to deal with that very specific issue. And then the third thing really Paul is going to talk about, he's going to talk about and deal with the issue that the Judaizers were bringing up. And that is, they said that if you get saved, this was their reasoning, if you get saved and you don't come underneath the law of God, and you are not underneath any law whatsoever, that's going to lead to licentious, loose, wide open living, and it is going to create chaos. That once you're saved, you need to come underneath the rules and the regulations of the law in order to be structured. And Paul is going to just take that apart. And he is going to explain that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we now enter into a relationship. And it is the law of love that is going to govern us, and not lawlessness that is going to take place. And then on top of that, he's going to talk about the fact that when we get saved, we have the in power of the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in us and that that Holy Spirit is now changing us from the inside out. Listen to this. So that we are now capable of living lives that are pleasing to God, whereas before the law was an external work that no one could actually keep. And so he is going to argue that a relationship, personal and intimate, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is far superior to a set of rules and regulations that no one can keep. And so we are going to see these three major themes as they are going to be brought out here in this letter that he writes this book to of uh, of Galatians. So let's jump into this uh, book now. Chapter 1, verse 1, and it says, Paul... An apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So here we see again in the opening of all the letters is the salutation. And the salutation, the form of the salutation is, is always the same. It starts off with an identification of who wrote it, and then who you're writing to, and then some some words of greeting and then the jumping into the body of the letter. So Paul begins by writing this letter with an identification of himself, Paul. And then notice how he identifies himself, an apostle. He jumps right to the very issue that the Judaizers uh, were attacking, that he is an apostle. But notice what it says. It says, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ. So he is claiming that he's an apostle, not by men or through men, but by Jesus Christ himself. Now remember what an apostle is. There were 12 apostles. These were disciples of Jesus. Remember he prayed about it and then he selected the 12 apostles. Uh, now, one of those apostles died, that was Judas. And then remember after his death that there was this, this conference that they had together and they had put two candidates forwards and then they had cast 
cast lots and then Matthias had been chosen and he was the replacement to Judas. Paul says that uh, he wasn't a, a, an apostle by man or through the choice of men, but that he was an apostle by Jesus Christ, by his direct authority. Now, the other 11 apostles, uh, they had been with Jesus in his earthly ministry, but Paul is the only one who was chosen to be an apostle, listen to this, by the risen Lord, by the risen Lord. And you remember how that happened. You remember how he was on the road to Damascus and, and Paul certainly had never volunteered to become an apostle. Paul had never put his name into a, a wanted, you know, a help wanted ad response here. You imagine, you know, wanted an apostle of Jesus Christ and apply within. Well, that was not what happened with Paul. You remember that he was persecuting the church. He was going into homes and he was tearing it up, dragging Christians out, having them arrested. And after he had created havoc in the church there in Jerusalem, he now got papers from the Sanhedrin to be able to go and make arrests in Damascus. And there he was on his way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, when the risen Lord met him and Paul falls onto his face before the risen Lord. And you remember that the Lord there commissioned him and called him. He says, you know, who, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom you have been persecuting. And he says, you know, that you now have been called to, to become an apostle. I am sending you out to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul had been commissioned by the Lord Jesus himself, called to be an apostle. He didn't sign up for it. Men didn't appoint him to it. He wasn't chosen or selected by a panel, but it was by the Lord Jesus uh, himself. He says in verse 2 now, he says, And to all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So here we see that the other brethren that who were with them, they were joining and appealing to the Galatians to hold fast to, to the gospel that had been preached to them. He says, to the churches of Galatia. And so those are the, the churches that are in the province of the Roman province of Galatia. He says, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. So we see grace and peace. And once again, these, these twin pillars that we see in the epistles, grace, we are saved by grace. It is unmerited favor from God that we receive this grace from God. And once we are saved, what do we experience? We experience peace with God. So it, peace with God is only experienced through the grace of God of receiving that gift of salvation. So so grace and peace, he says, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. And so here we see that it was Christ who gave himself for our sins. Now, the plan of salvation, God had created the plan of salvation before he even created Adam and Eve. God knew that in order to create mankind, to enter into a loving relationship with him, that he had to give us free will. That free will is a necessary component to love. If God created us and programmed us to love him automatically, then that's not love. That that is not love. Love has to have the freedom of choice to enter in and to truly be a loving relationship. So in order for God to create us and to have a real authentic love relationship with us, he had to create us as self-determinant beings and give us free will. But God also knew that if he gave us free will, that there's not one of us that wouldn't use that free will to break the moral law that would offend him. And so God created now this plan of salvation whereby he would send his son to rescue those who wanted to have an authentic relationship with God, could choose God, 
and then they could be washed and cleansed of their sin and they could spend eternity with God. And so it wasn't as if Adam and Eve were in the garden, God created them, they were sinless there, the garden environment was beautiful, and then Adam and Eve sinned and God said, oh no, look what happened. Now what do we do? Let's go to plan B here, you know, and, and suddenly they thought before Adam and Eve were ever even created, God had planned this. And it was before Adam and Eve were ever even created that Jesus agreed that he would become man incarnate, that he would go and live the perfect life, rescue us from our sins and be our savior who would reconcile us into the father. And so the plan of salvation before time was even established here. And what it, was that plan that he might deliver us from this present evil age? Prior to our salvation, sin held us hostage. We were governed over by our lower base instincts and carnal nature. But now we have been set free of being controlled by that. We are free to resist temptation. Whereas before we would succumb to that temptation, now we are able to resist it. And so we have been delivered from the control of the world and from our culture and from this present evil age. And we have the choice of being able to resist. And so this all being according, it says, to the will of our God and Father. So he is the one who had planned out our salvation and gave us the mechanism by which we can be saved from this present to evil age. And look at what Paul says in verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. What a glorious plan that we can engage God, we can enter into a personal, intimate relationship, and that we can have our sins forgiven us. So with that as his introduction, Paul then jumps into one of the main reasons that he is writing this letter. And it's found here in verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, I marvel. I am surprised. I am amazed. I am disappointed. He says that you are turning away. Now that word for turning away is actually a military term in the original language in Greek. And it means to desert. The, the, the military term for deserting the army. He says, I am so disappointed that you guys are deserting the truth. I had placed you into the truth. You were growing in the truth. And now suddenly you are deserting the truth. He says, to a different gospel. But the reality is there is no different gospel. That's what he's going to say. There isn't a different gospel. There's only a perverted gospel. There's only one true gospel. Now the word gospel in the original language just means good news. And what was the good news? That we who are sinners could have our sins forgiven us and we can be reconciled to God and spend eternity with God in heaven and that all through Christ Jesus. He is the rescuer. He is our savior. He is the Lord. He is the one that has made peace and reconciled us to God the Father. That is the good news and there is no other good news. He says, but I recognize there are some who are coming and, and they are troubling you. These were the Judaizers who were now coming and they were declaring that, that the gospel was not enough as it stood. In verse 8, Paul writes, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul says, this is the gospel. He says, I received it straight from the Lord's mouth, and I have delivered it to you. He says, and if anybody else comes and tells you any other gospel, he says, don't receive it. It is not true. The gospel that you have is the true gospel. Hold on to it with both hands. He says, even if an angel came and appeared to you. Imagine if an angel appeared to you. <laughs> That'd be pretty awesome, you know. And here comes this powerful angel and says, I have the gospel for you. would be like, wow. But what is Paul saying? Paul also will let us know that Satan masquerades as what? 
as an angel of light, uh, as a deceiver. So he says, even if an angel comes. So if a man comes, don't believe him. If an angel comes, don't believe him. Why? Because what trumps an angel? <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the gospel that he received came straight from the Lord's mouth. So even if an angelic being came and tried to tell you other than what you already have, you have got the truth. Hold on to the truth with both hands. This is what Paul is declaring to them here. He says, if anybody preaches any other gospel to you, even an angel, let him be accursed. Then in verse 9, for emphasis, he says, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. Now, Paul says in verse 9, as we have said before, this refers to when he was there with them. And so this wasn't something that was new to him. The new to them, he is reiterating what he had already declared. Don't let anybody change the gospel of grace. It is not grace plus anything. It is just simply grace. Now, there are many groups where works play a very important part in their doctrine and in their framework. We have the Jehovah's Witnesses, and we see that they are driven by a desire of earning their position in heaven. That's why they're so diligent in going around on Saturdays from door to door. They're diligent to spread because their salvation is dependent upon it. They're not interested in your salvation when they come and talk to you. What they're trying to do is secure their salvation. That's why they are out there uh, working so hard. And, and then you've got the Mormons. And, and the Mormons, they have to be, you know, and they have their marriages sealed in the temple. And they have to wear their proper undergarments. And all of these things are important if you're going to go out and, and get a planet and become your own God. And all of these things that they have to do uh, in order for them to be able to achieve uh, their salvation. It's not just by faith in Christ Jesus. It's then all these other additional things that are required. Paul says there is no plus anything. It is just simply your relationship of receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and allowing him to wash away your sins. That, that he is the mediator between God and man. And it's not mediation plus anything else. It is just simply our relationship with Jesus Christ. He says in verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men for if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul says that, of course, there are people who don't like me. He says, but I don't seek to please men. I'm not a man pleaser. I'm not a person that changes my opinion according to the polls. What do the people want? Well, then that's who I will become. Paul was anything but a chameleon. Paul was a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls himself a bondser. He says, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am doing what he has commanded me to do. And I don't care what people think of me. I'm not trying to become popular. I'm just trying to be obedient to what I have been called to do. And as Christians, that's what we need to also be. We just need to be obedient to live out our faith in our culture, in front of our culture, and on display of our culture. And not try and sugarcoat our Christianity or our faith in order to make sure that we are accepted and, and not taking and, and making anybody upset with, with who we are. We make no apologies for our faith. We stand in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and we stand to love others and to invite everybody into this relationship that we are experiencing with the true and the living God. So Paul says that I don't try and seek uh, to please men. That's not the purpose. I am seeking only to please the one that I am going to stand before one day and give an account to, to how I lived out my life. He says in verse 11, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, 
but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in Judaism, everything was taught and handed down by rabbi by rabbi by rabbi. So whenever you were talking about anything, you were always quoting, as the great rabbi so-and-so said, and, and you would always be quoting the sources of your knowledge. Paul is saying that I did not receive the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. I didn't receive it from men. I didn't sit at the feet of the apostles. I wasn't taught this by Peter, or James, or John, or any of the others. He says, this came straight from the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And what an experience that had to have been for Paul, as he is going to begin to unwind his testimony, bringing it all the way back to when he first met the Lord there on the road to Damascus. I mean, here is a man who is bent on the destruction of Christians, who believed that Christians were perpetrating a lie. And what was the lie? The lie that he believed that Christians were perpetrating was that the Messiah had come and that the Messiah was Jesus Christ. And so to Paul, the, this was an outright lie and it was a leading people away from Judaism and the faith that they had received through Moses there on Mount Sinai. And so to Paul, he was keeping God's law intact and he was protecting the, the revelation of a worship as had been given by revelation to Moses. And so uh, he says in verse 13, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to what? To destroy it. He was trying to destroy the entire Christian faith. He says, and I advanced in Judaism, verse 14, beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Now, you'll remember that Paul had been born in Tarsus uh, in Cilicia, but he had been raised, remember, in Jerusalem. He moved to Jerusalem and he was raised there and he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. And so he became a Pharisee. Remember that the Pharisees, they were the strictest group of uh, the Jews. They were the ones that tried to keep the minutia of the law and did every single thing they could to keep more of the law than anybody else. Paul says that he was zealous and that he had advanced beyond his contemporaries uh, in the keeping. Now notice what it says, for the traditions of my fathers. Now notice that it doesn't say uh, in the keeping of the law or in the law, but it was in the traditions here that he says there's a big difference. The traditions, what are the traditions that he's talking about? The traditions are the oral traditions that were added to the law. You had the law. You shall not work on the Sabbath. That was the law. But then remember they had to define, well, what exactly is work? You know, how much work is work before it's work? And then they started to have all of their rules and their regulations. And this became the oral traditions. And so you would study all of the oral traditions. And as the oral traditions began to grow up around the law, you stopped studying the law and you started to study the oral traditions. And pretty soon the law was insulated by the oral traditions that nobody could ever completely grasp and get their arms all the way around, let alone ever keep it. But Paul was saying, if anybody ever tried, it was me. I tried. I tried to get my mind around it, and I did every single thing that I could to keep all of those traditions that were based upon the law. He says in verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul here says that he was chosen, listen to this, he was chosen to be an apostle before he was even born. How awesome is that? God had a plan for his life even before he was born. And do you know what? God has a plan for your life. And he had that plan for your life even before you were born. It was going to take a specific type of person. 
who was going to be able to go and, and, and endure the batterings that Paul endured to be able to plant the seed of the gospel into the Gentile cities and to form those early churches against the persecution and the hardship and the difficulty. And so Paul uh, was created by God before he was ever even born with the tenacity and with the characteristics that were going to be necessary for him to hold up and to bear up and to carry that gospel and to plant it to all of the various different churches. And so God created him with the provisions to be able to be successful in the purpose for which he was called before he was even born. And while he's studying the law and all that, God was going to use all of that. And so we see him here declaring that before he was even born, he was called from his mother's womb. Now I want you to know that in the Old Testament, there are various different prophets that also were called to be prophets from their mother's womb. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 49, it says, Listen, O coastlands to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. So Isaiah, from the womb, he was called to be a prophet. In Jeremiah chapter 1, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Listen to that. God knew you before he ever even made you. He knew you in his mind. Uh, he knew you already. He says, I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. We see John the Baptist also was called even before his conception to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And so Paul here also saying that he was called to be an apostle uh, from his mother's womb that he might preach among the Gentiles. And so God has a plan for your life before you were ever even born. God knew the role that you were to play in this generation, in this time, in the building forth of the kingdom of God here upon earth. And we see in Ephesians chapter 2 that it says that every single believer is created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He has equipped you and given you the skill and the giftings and every single thing that you need to be able to accomplish, listen to this, the purpose that he created you for. He fitted you to be a, a specific part of the overall plan of the building forth of the kingdom of God. And I think about, you know, fine Swiss watches and the tiny little sprockets that are all in there. And you know, he created you to be a sprocket in the gear of the mechanism of the building forth of the kingdom of God. And he designed you to fit in perfectly to be able to take your place, to be able to make everything move forwards. And so God has a plan for your life. And we need to yield to that plan to ask God for that plan and be submitted to that plan and then allow God to exercise his plan for our life and through our lives. And so we were created for every good work which he prepared beforehand. And so Paul's on the road to Damascus and all of a sudden he meets the risen Lord and his whole world is just shattered. I mean, he is there in the Lord. He says, you know, who are you, Lord? And, and he says, you know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, you know, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you've been persecuting. It's difficult to kick against the goads. And, and suddenly now, Saul, who becomes and Paul, recognizes that everything that he thought is wrong. Everything that he thought was wrong. And what he had been diligently pursuing was not building the kingdom of God, but was actually working against God. And that just undid Paul. And so what did Paul do? He doesn't immediately go to the disciples now and, and ask for an evaluation. How can this be? How can Jesus be the Messiah? See, that was the huge question in Paul's heart. Because he had messianic expectations. He was hoping for the Messiah who was going to come and set up his kingdom. 
that was the hope of all of Israel. And as a Pharisee, he certainly had that hope. But now suddenly this crucified Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, wow. <laughs> That's like... I need to go process that uh, and figure that out. And so Paul takes a three-year hiatus. And he just goes into the deserts of Arabia. And the Lord starts to show him through the scriptures. Because Paul was a man of the word. But he had never seen the Lord in the Old Testament. He had never seen where this plan of salvation is there from Genesis to Malachi. Uh, if you just have eyes to see it. And so the Lord begins to reveal and start to show all of this to Paul during those three years of where now he is just being ministered to by the Lord there in the desert in Arabia. He says in verse 16, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. I didn't immediately go and say, okay, tell me how this works and, and explain this to me, guys. He says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So three years he spends in Arabia. And after three years in Arabia, remember that he's on the road to Damascus is where he encounters the Lord. After his three years in Arabia, you know what he does? He goes back to Damascus now. This is where he was brought into the city, blinded by the revelation of the Lord. That was where uh, he was prayed for and he had his sight that was regained. That was all in Damascus. He returns back to Damascus and you know what he starts to do? Preach the gospel. He starts preaching the gospel. Imagine that. Damascus is the very city that he went to tear up the Christians. And now, where does he begin his ministry? Right in Damascus, and he starts preaching in Damascus. What happens? Do they receive it very well? No. Remember, everybody gets mad at him there in Damascus, and the governor was going to arrest him, and they had the, 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 the wanted posters of, of uh, Paul up on the walls there and at the post office. And so uh, Paul had to, then he had to go, and he was let down over the wall in a basket to, to save his life. So he gets down off of the walls. He's like, okay, that didn't go so well. <laughs> now what? Now where do I go? So what he does next is Paul then goes and presents himself to the leadership there in Jerusalem. Now, one of the charges against Paul by the Judaizers is they were saying, we don't even know Paul. In the church in Jerusalem, nobody knows who Paul is. In fact, if, if you put a lineup of, of men, we couldn't pick Paul out from a lineup. And do you want to know what? They're right. Because Paul didn't spend any time in the Jerusalem church. He ends up going to Jerusalem and he's going to spend a couple of weeks. He's going to spend 15 days there with Peter. And then he's also going to meet with James, who is the Lord's brother. But other than that, he was not introduced to the rest of the leadership. Look with me here in verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem. His three years were in Arabia. Then he goes to Damascus. Now he comes to Jerusalem. It says, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So he's 15 days in, in Jerusalem. And then he leaves Jerusalem. Why? Because, uh, remember, he was known in Jerusalem. He was a Pharisee. He had been a part of the Sanhedrin. He was one of the up-and-comers there in Jerusalem. And remember, he had had the letters to go and to drag the Christians out. Now he shows up back in, in Jerusalem again. And he's a Christian. He had been arresting Christians. Now he comes back and he is a Christian. And that made the Jews angry. And now they wanted to kill Paul. And so Paul now by revelation is so, hey, Paul, well, I'm glad you, you need to get out of Jerusalem right now. And so Paul departs from Jerusalem and he goes back to Tarsus. 
and he goes back to his hometown and he's there in Cilicia. You remember that later on Barnabas goes from Jerusalem to Antioch and it's in Antioch where the church is exploding and they need some help and Barnabas goes over to Tarsus and gets Paul and then brings him over to Antioch to help lead. And then it was when Paul's ministry there in Antioch with Barnabas that the Lord then said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. And that's when he goes off onto his first missionary journey. So Paul is now giving the explanation to the churches that are there in Galatia why he wasn't well known in the Jerusalem church. It's not some nefarious plot. He, he wasn't avoiding the, the church in Jerusalem or that he didn't have a good reputation. He says, I presented myself to the other apostles and they validated that I was a, an apostle. He says, I just didn't work out of Jerusalem. That wasn't my home turf. He says in verse 20, now concerning the things which I write to you indeed before God I do not lie and afterward I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia so he goes back home back to Tarsus um, after Jerusalem and that's where Barnabas ends up coming and getting him verse 22 and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ he says but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. He says, I wasn't known by face, but I was known by reputation. And the reputation that I had, can you believe the guy that used to tear it up is now going and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? And he says in verse 24, and they glorified God in me. And so he is giving his testimony here, you know, who he was before Christ and then who he is now in Christ. And and that change, that delta in math, the change between the two values, that is God. That is the glory of God that is in our lives that changes us from who we were to who we are now. And God is building a testimony in every single one of our lives. He is building a testimony in your life. He's building a testimony in my life. And our testimony began the day that we got saved. And now it's continuing to be built. And there's one thing that no one can argue with you on. And that is your testimony. Who I was before and who I am now. No one can argue. And that change, that's the glory of God. That's where God gets the glory. Now, when you think about a testimony, I think that Paul is the ultimate extreme. Because, you know, it starts with who I was before Christ. So look at Paul, who he was before Christ. He, he wasn't neutral. He was anti-Christian. You know, he was persecuting Christians. So that's like all the way at the bottom. I don't think you can get any lower uh, than that than actually persecuting God's people. And then who does he become? He goes all the way to an apostle, one that's chosen by God uh, to go out and preach the gospel. So that's like he wins. You know, I mean, that's the that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate uh, uh, of change. And who gets the credit for that change? The Lord. God gets the glory in your life. And in my life, God gets the glory for our change. The Bible says that we are his workmanship. Christianity isn't a self-help program. It's not you get the Bible and go work it out now, you know, and change yourself by these, by these rules. If we changed ourselves, who would get the glory? We would get the glory. Okay, but God is the one that gets the glory. We are the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that changes us so the world sees the change. But God gets the glory. God gets the credit for that change in our lives. And, and how is your testimony going? How are you doing in your growth? God's trying to do an amazing work in your life, just like he did an amazing work in Paul's life. And God has a plan for your life, but he needs our cooperation. He needs us to yield to his plan for our life. God wants us to be sanctified and he wants us to be yielded to him and he wants us to be cooperating with his plan for our lives. And, and the way that our testimony continues to be written is by that gentle, soft, yielded heart 
that doesn't resist uh, the work of the Holy Spirit that God is trying to do in, in our lives. And so may we continue to surrender our will to God's will. May we recognize that he's the author of our salvation, that he's writing out our testimony for his glory and for our victory. Now, I want you to know that the more surrendered that we are to God in our lives, the richer our lives are. So God is trying to take you, he's trying to take me to a better quality of life as he draws us nearer to himself. And the nearer that you get to God, the sweeter that your life becomes. The sweeter that your life becomes. Regardless of circumstances, he doesn't promise you an easier life, but this is what he promises, a sweeter life, a richer life a more blessed life, a life that is more worthwhile living. And so God is trying to draw every single one of us to continue to, to step up and to continue to draw nearer uh, and nearer to him. And so he tells us, test and see, and taste, come, draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. God won't force himself on you. And listen to this. He's not going to force his plan into your life. If you're waiting for God to make you do his plan in your life, you're going to wait till your last breath because he's a gentleman. He invites you into his plan for your life, but you have to want that. That has to be your free will that chooses his plan for your life over your own set of plans. And so Paul was yielded. He says, I'm a bond servant. That's his identity. He said, I'm just a slave. Just Lord, you tell me what to do. I'm doing it. I'm not making any decisions on my own. I'm just going to be 100% yielded to him. And may we also be 100% yielded to God's will in our life for his glory, but for our blessing, for the richness of our own life, we will benefit from being obedient to, to God's plan. Before you were formed, he had the highest and best life planned out for you. And from now till the day that you die, you can still live out the highest and best plan that he has for your life if we will just yield to it. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for a minute to verse 8, where it says that if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel uh, than what we've preached, let him be a curse. And it was that any other gospel that, uh, that really struck me. And in verse 9, he repeats it again, as we have said before. So now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel, because there is no other gospel. There is just one plan of salvation. And that plan of salvation is that Jesus Christ would come and he would wash our souls uh, of our sins. And here is the reality, that every single one of us is a sinner. The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. That every single one of us is a sinner. But all sinners, listen to this, are divided into two categories. There are the sinners whose souls have been washed of their sins, and there are sinners whose souls have never been washed of our sins. And how you die is going to make that state that you are in eternal. If you die with your soul still stained from your sins, then you will stand before God, listen, with a stained soul. And God says that he will not allow anybody whose soul is stained with sin to bring their sin into heaven. And they will be excluded forever separated from God's presence forever. Jesus Christ was sent to come. He lived the perfect life to rescue us as the Savior to come down and to now wash away our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins and now we have his righteousness. He took our sins and he died on the cross. And that is the gospel. And that's what Paul wanted to go around to every single person. Say there's one gospel. Have your sins been forgiven and washed in the shed blood of Jesus Christ? And that was the only thing that Paul wanted to know. Why? Because it is the most important decision that a person will ever make in their entire life. God gave you free will. And you can choose every different decision that you can possibly want in your life. But there is one critical, more important decision than any other decision. And what will be determined is your eternal destiny is going to be determined by your free will and what you choose. 
And what you choose is you either choose to have your sins washed away by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, or you choose not to. And if you choose not to, then you are separated from God. Now, for every single one of us that has, your testimony begins with the moment that you receive Christ and allow him to come and to wash away your sin, and that becomes your starting point. And between there and the time that you die, that's the work that God's done in your life. And this morning, if there is anybody here that has never had their starting point, that, that has never started a testimony because they've never accepted Jesus Christ, I couldn't end this service without giving you an opportunity to start your testimony here this morning. If you're a sinner, and we all are, so I'm talking to everybody, if you're a sinner, but you've never had your sins washed away, then don't leave here without exercising your free will to make the best decision that you will ever make in your entire life and start your testimony right now. We're going to worship through one song. And if you have never started your testimony, if your sins are still on your soul, if you've never been washed by the shed blood of the Lamb, then now is the time I'm going to invite you to just stand up and come to the front. I'm going to lead you at the end of the song. Whoever is standing here, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer of inviting Christ to, into your heart to wash your sins away. Your testimony begins today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can enter into peace with God and experience that grace of the forgiveness of your sins. And if that's you, then right now, now is your time to take that step of action. God won't force himself on you. You've got to choose him, but you can choose him right now. Stand up and come forwards and receive Christ. Stand and come now. Come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ just stand and come now if you want to have your soul washed by the Lord are you hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of the sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for the gift of salvation that we have received. Lord, we are so grateful that our sins have been washed away that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit and that you are creating our testimonies in our lives. God, we ask that you would help us to continue to draw closer to you, that we would continue to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
God, we want to surrender our life for the life that you have planned for us. So would you help us to be able to do that? Minister to us, uh, Lord, in our brokenness, would you bring healing, God? In our weakness, would you bring strength? Father, would you show yourself mighty in our lives as we cry out to you this morning? Touch us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. If you need prayer, I want to invite you to come up for prayer after service. And also, if you've never accepted the, the Lord, if you had wanted to stand up and you didn't, then you can still come up afterwards and we can still take care of that. Next weekend, Galatians chapter 2. So I want to invite you to go ahead and read forwards uh, on that. We'll look at it next time. Our midweek, we are looking at 2 Samuel, the life of David. So I want to encourage you to come out for that as well. May you have a great week. May you enjoy the game afterwards if you are going to be watching some kind of game that's on today. Um, somebody came up to me after service and they said, hey, they were listening on uh, and someone had told them that if you love church as much as you love football, that you should get a bucket of Gatorade and dump it on your pastor. <laughs> and I thought, I said, that is just not right uh, at all in any way, shape, or form. So I rebuked that. So anyways, may, uh, may the Lord, may you just have a great, great week drawing near to the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let's stand to close. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Have a great day.